Prefaces of 1848 and 1867 of Dombey and Son This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens Prefaces of 1848 and 1867 Preface of 1848 I cannot forgo my usual opportunity of saying farewell to my readers in this greeting-place, though I have only to acknowledge the unbounded warmth and earnestness of their sympathy in every stage of the journey we have just concluded. If any of them have felt a sorrow in one of the principal incidents on which this fiction turns, I hope it may be a sorrow of that sort which endears the sharers in it one to another. This is not unselfish in me. I may claim to have felt it, at least as much as anybody else, and I would fain be remembered kindly for my part in the experience. Devonshire Terrace, 24th March, 1848 End of Preface of 1848 Preface of 1867 I make so bold as to believe that the faculty, or the habit, of correctly observing the characters of men, is a rare one. I have not even found within my experience that the faculty, or the habit, of correctly observing so much as the faces of men, is a general one by any means. The two commonest mistakes in judgment that I suppose to arise from the former default are the confounding of shyness with arrogance, a very common mistake indeed, and the not understanding that an obstinate nature exists in a perpetual struggle with itself. Mr. Dombey undergoes no violent change, either in this book or in real life. A sense of his injustice is within him all along. The more he represses it, the more unjust he necessarily is. Internal shame and external circumstances may bring the contest to a close in a week or a day, but it has been a contest for years, and it is only fought out after a long balance of victory. I began this book by the Lake of Geneva, and went on with it for some months in France, before pursuing it in England. The association between the writing and the place of writing is so curiously strong in my mind, that at this day, although I know, in my fancy, every stair in the little midshipman's house, and could swear to every pew in the church in which Florence was married, or to every young gentleman's bedstead in Dr. Blimber's establishment, I yet confusedly imagine Captain Cuttle as secluding himself from Mrs. Max Stinger among the mountains of Switzerland. Similarly, when I am reminded by any chance of what it was that the waves were always saying, my remembrance wanders for a whole winter night about the streets of Paris, as I restlessly did with a heavy heart, on the night when I had written the chapter in which my little friend and I parted company. End of Preface of 1867